Colossians chapter 3 is where we are again today. Those of you who have been with us the last two weeks know that we are still in Colossians 3, verse 12 through 17. But although I had a, I had a thought that maybe I'd go another message out of this at the end of the last service, I decided we'll, just, we'll end this, this passage today. Colossians 3, 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, these things put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God. Father, as we look to your word now, we ask that you would instruct us, that you would give us open hearts to the lesson you have for us today. In the name of Christ, amen. So we've been looking at these six verses, 12 through 17, for three weeks. And we, we started off, I started off with my um, intention to, to preach one sermon of these three uh, with these three points, to, to we bear with one another and forgive one another and teach and admonish one another. And as, as you walked this journey with me, we, we lengthened that out, giving each of them a, its own week. And um, they're actually part, the, the, within these verses are a series of one another admonitions, or commands from Scripture, which are just a part of like 18 or 20 different one another's in scripture and they are dramatic statements that really impact the way we respond to one another and they talk about how we live out our christian faith on within the body of believers and so we've we've talked about on bearing with one another and and the 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 task that we have to put on compassionate hearts to treat one another with kindness and humility and meekness and then from there the scripture took us into the 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 command to forgive one another as god has forgiven us and we looked interestingly at the two different words for forgiveness of fatimai and karitsamai and if you didn't hear that sermon last week i i highly encourage you to go online and listen to that on um, particularly if you're struggling with issues of forgiveness in your own life on um, because on um, the God's word is just incredibly wonderful and powerful. And as, as we look at this passage in Colossians 3, which tells us to forgive one another, um, our eyes were open to what that means and, and how that gives grace to us and to people around us and, and the way it, it enables us to actually live a life with compassionate hearts and meekness and kindness and humility. And, and the, the passage has moved on now to the concept of and teaching and admonishing one another. And so that's what we're going to look at today, that whatever you do, admonish, teach and admonish. And there are actually two different words, obviously, used there, uh, which mean two different things, and almost two sides of the same coin, because teaching and admonishing both have the, the end goal of facilitating some change in the lives of those that we are teaching and admonishing. Teaching is, is more positive, so you might teach someone how to tie their shoe. And you might admonish someone not to stick their hand on a hot stove. So one has more with, with the giving of positive precepts, and the other has more to do with, with warning and, and giving on advice to say, stay away from that, don't go down that road. It, it, and so the two terms are put together in this context, and I'm going to use them pretty much interchangeably rather than keep on saying teach and admonish. Just recognize that when I say teach and when I say admonish, I'm talking about both because that's what the passage is talking about in, in, that we're looking at this morning. And, and Paul is going to give us three keys to teaching and admonishing effectively. 
three keys to how we can give people the information, both positively and in terms of a warning, that will help them live their lives in a way which is God-honoring. And the first of those keys is to focus on the Word of God. The, the passage tells us that we are to let the Word of God, or let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. This is, this is the, the precursor to teaching and admonishing. Obviously, within the context that we're looking at here, we're not talking about, teach me how to change my oil. You know, frankly, all you need is a little bit of experience. You've got to be a little bit gearhead to teach me how to change my oil. Here, Paul is talking about spiritual things. And in order to teach and admonish people on spiritual things, you need first to dwell richly in the Word of God. You need to be in touch with God's Word. You need to be filled with it and stewed in it. You have to have an understanding of the spiritual blessings that are found in God's Word before you can in turn effectively teach and admonish others on the basis of God's Word. We will not be able to effectively teach and admonish if we ourselves are, all, are not already steeped in God's Word. In order for us to fulfill this mandate to teach and admonish one another, we have to get into God's Word ourselves. We have to get into God's Word ourselves. And as, as much as, as my preaching may be the best preaching in, uh, uh, on this block, on well, don't want to go too far, on, it, it may be the best preaching you're going to hear today, unless you've turned on the radio. Um, if that's all you get, if, if your, your exposure to God's Word is what happens on Sunday morning, albeit good teaching, that's not enough. That's not going to graduate you to the point where you can effectively teach and admonish spiritual things to other people. You have to internalize it yourself. You have to be having a part of your life. You have to be involved in some sort of systematic Bible study on your own. One of the dangers we face in, in our spiritual walk today is that we do have a plethora of good teaching available to us. You simply turn on the radio and there's like three or four or five different radio stations, Christian radio stations in Grand Junction, and you can hear pretty good sermons. You can get, hear sermons from people like Chuck Swindoll. You know, people use my name and his a lot in the same sentence. It usually goes like this. That Chuck Swindoll... He's no Steve Johnson. Okay, it might be the other way around. Um, you can hear fantastic sermons and you can get the, 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 the teaching from great speakers and great uh, expositors of God's Word and never get into God's Word yourself. And therein is the problem. Because I can give you some tasty morsels, some wonderful spiritual truths that you can go home with and maybe they'll sustain you through the week. And I hope they do. But if you are going to begin to be part of God's ministry of teaching and admonishing one another, you need to study God's Word yourself. Because I guarantee you, I don't put in a half an hour to prepare for a half hour sermon. That there's an awful lot of study that goes in. There's 33 years of pastoral ministry that goes behind every sermon, along with 15 to 20 hours of study for one sermon, and, and I give it to you in 30 minutes. See, you need to spend the 15, 20 hours. You need to begin to, to mine the depths of God's Word in order that you will be able to teach and admonish others, in order that you will have such an understanding of God's Word that you begin to have the lights go on and say, this is what applies in this situation. The systematic study of God's Word enables us to be so grounded that we will be ready to give a defense for what we believe whenever the, see, the, the time arrives and the needs arise. And so Paul is saying, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And in order for that to happen, you need more than Sunday morning. You need to find your Bible and open it up and read it. And by the way, if, if, you, if it comes a Sunday morning and you're frantically searching around the house for where you left your Bible a week ago or... Three weeks ago when you last came to church, you are not preparing yourself to teach and admonish others. And it is somewhat presumptuous to believe that you can effectively teach and admonish others if you yourself are not drinking deeply from the wells of Scripture. Paul says, teach and admonish, but first, focus on the Word. 
Focus on the, on the Word of God in your own life. Focus it on it so that you have a full understanding of it, so that you don't go and you begin to teach and you realize, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. Focus on the Word of God. It's the first key to teaching and admonishing one another effectively. The second is to do so with all wisdom, to rely upon wisdom. The text, it's what the text says, you know, teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing is actually closely tied to wisdom. You, you would hope that you don't begin the endeavor of teaching and admonishing unless you have wisdom in your own heart. And teaching and admonishing, and maybe especially admonishing, no matter how well intentioned, no matter how much on target, can actually provoke the opposite result if not done with wisdom. Because there are times when wisdom tells us that we should just back off. And other times when wisdom tells us we should push forward. We have to have wisdom which comes from a working knowledge of Scripture and at the same time a working knowledge of people. Wisdom is the ability to think and to use uh, our knowledge and experience and understanding and common sense and insight. Wisdom is, is putting together that knowledge which you can gain from reading the Scripture with knowing the Holy Spirit. And you put the two together in, in, in a practical knowledge. And within this context... It implies the ability to merge the exegesis of culture, the exegesis of people, with the exegesis of Scripture. Now, I know I'm using big words there. With, it, it, it is, it is the, the ability to merge together our understanding of Scripture with our understanding of people. That is part of what wisdom is in, within this context. It is knowledge rightly applied first to ourselves and then cautiously to others. Paul says, teach and admonish with all wisdom. It involves an understanding of, of people as well as an understanding of, of the Bible. And it involves a willingness as well as the ability to apply perception and judgment to a particular situation. Teaching and admonishing, which chooses the right time and the right method so as to actually benefit those who te we teach and admonish. And it is, it is a tough thing. And oftentimes, complaints that I, I hear from people and one another, they say, well, you know, he said the right thing, but he said it at the wrong time, or he said it in the wrong way. And we get mad at them, and I want to say, well, let's look up in this text here a little bit for, if you have a complaint against someone, forgive them, but then recognize that although they may have lacked the wisdom to hit the right time and the right phrase, their heart usually is right. We're going to come back to that in a little bit because uh, of the issue of forgiveness. But Paul says, teach and admonish in all wisdoms. Sometimes the wisest thing to do is shut up and allow the Holy Spirit to do His work. You know, sometimes you, you know the truth. You know the right answer to a question. And I, I, I submit to you there are times when it just it can drive you crazy because there's someone going on about something and you realize they don't have a clue what they're talking about. Do I have an amen? Good. Any doctors could test to that? No. I read something online that says this. <laughs> and the doctor's going, okay. My, how many years did you go to the med school? You know, all that's... All that's, you know, overrun by, you know, one Google search. You know, there's times when you're, 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 you know that, you know there's something and you're going, man, I, I should just set them straight. But oftentimes the best response is that to shut up and let them learn. Other times the right response, the wise response is to gently say, okay, I appreciate that, but let's check the source. And you don't tune to Google. You go to the Bible. You know, I, I sit in the Bible studies. I talk with people. I counsel with somebody. said, the Bible says, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. And I say, really? Do you have a verse that says that? Because I'm looking for it. And I really think cleanliness is next to impossible. But... If you can find it in there, I'll, I'll obey it. it. We had this issue with all sorts of things, don't we? Because we want to impose on the Scripture things that we think are wise. I think it's wise for you not to smoke. 
I think it's wise. Most doctors would agree. I think it's wise not to smoke. But I have searched from Genesis to maps. I can't find the Bible say it. It says other stuff. It says don't lie, don't gossip, don't cheat. You know, it doesn't even mention smoking. Yeah. The people will say, oh, the, the Bible says this. Well, let's, let's go to the source. And sometimes people are actually open and say, wow, you're right. I did make some leaps from the, your body's the temple of the Lord to, therefore, you can't do things I would never do myself anyway. That's one of the only things I found interesting. When people say, well, the, you know, it doesn't say you can't smoke, but it says your body is a temple of the Lord. And say, so you can't smoke because that's damaging the temple of the Lord. And I said, yeah, and how's that blood pressure medicine working for you? And, you know, and, and how's that uh, six-pack? I mean, that, I don't have a six-pack. I have a keg. You know, some people are content with a six-pack. What was up with that? You know, we, we pick our our sins, right? We want to condemn the sins we would never commit. And we justify Scripture, and sometimes we need to come back to the Word. And there are actually people who you can sit down and say, let's study this. I'd like to find out why you as believers in, in Jesus Christ are opposed to gay marriage. So what's the bottom line issue there? Are you opposed to it just because somebody told you you should be opposed to it? Do the study yourself. Sometimes you also have to come to a person and say, Stop that! No, you can't have an affair! I know, I had to wake you up. <laughs> See, wisdom says sometimes you keep your mouth shut, sometimes you speak softly, and sometimes you rescue people from the precipice of danger. You pull them back off the cliff. You teach and admonish in wisdom. Paul offers a third key to teaching and admonishing. And that is perhaps the easiest. It is one which we have all participated in this morning. And you didn't even know it. And that is to utilize worship. The text says it very simply. It says, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Singing as a means of teaching and admonishing. It is one of the reasons that singing is a part of our worship experience. There's a reason why everybody on our worship team knows that we are not giving a concert on Sunday morning. That we really aren't here just to hear a concert. We are here to worship corporately and in our worship, in our singing, we teach and admonish one another. There's a reason why we sing Christian songs. I mean, we could get together and sing a bunch of country western songs. Although, personally, I can't understand why anybody would want to, but to each his own. Um, sorry for those of you country music lovers. Just not my cup of tea. There are, there are songs that we can sing. You know, there's love songs. Maybe you and your spouse have a love song. It's your song. It's kind of an odd thing. It's not really your song. But, you know, you have a song which emotes in you this great sense of love and, and it reminds you of, of your first date or whatever. There are catchy songs. You know, Let It Go. That's a cool song. But... We, can, we might be able to spiritualize it. They, they might make you feel good. They might give you laughter and compassion. But they don't teach you anything about God. They don't give you anything substantive. And we encourage you to sing with us in our corporate worship, whether you have a good voice or a bad voice. You know, the Bible says, make a joyful noise which allows me to sing and allows you to sing together, whether it sounds good to the, to the musicians among us, doesn't matter. Because it sounds good to God. Because He's the one who gave us our voices. And we sing 
Because it is in the psalms and the hymns and the spiritual songs where we teach and admonish one another and we often go home not with a tasty morsel from the pastor's sermon, although I hope you do take something down and say, I want to remember this. But you often go home thinking, ah, man, we sang My Country Tis of Thee or we sang Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. And our worship on Sunday, we want to be the soundtrack of your worship life for the next week. We want you to be familiar enough with the songs that you're singing them and you're, and you're brought back to this experience of corporate worship, which is also corporate teaching and admonishing of one another. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, it's kind of cool that Paul actually anticipated what was going to happen musically and worship-wise in the church in the 20th century and 21st century, that he said, we should sing psalms, things coming out of the Psalter, and hymns written in the 1980s or 1890s. You know, that, that Paul, when he was writing this back, you know, 2,000 years ago, anticipated the Wesleys doing their, writing their hymns, right? And he anticipated, you know, the 1970s and the praise songs and the spiritual songs that we sing now. That's what Paul was thinking of, right? No. See, we get caught up in these words, you know. And, and I've actually had people say, you know, the Bible says in Colossians 3, you've got to sing hymns. Bring me back Amazing Grace. Okay, but Amazing Grace wasn't written then. That's not what the, that's not what the text is saying. Paul is simply using three phrases, three terms, to, to bring to mind the... the of a rich variety of Christian music, which is utilized by the Holy Spirit to teach and admonish one another. And that's what we did today. So we sang, My Country Tis of Thee. And we sang the National Anthem, which is probably called something else. But we, we did the American Exceptionalism Woo-ha! Go America! And American exceptionalism aside, because not everybody's American, and some of the people who aren't American are going to heaven. And they might not sing the national anthem in heaven. But if you can lay, say, lay, lay aside the idea of American exceptionalism and look at the words of what we sang, what you see in a song like My Country Tisby is not merely a patriotic song, but a song which calls us to remember that every blessing we have comes from the Almighty God. It is a song which calls us to trust in Him, regardless of our nationality. And we sing, 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 another song, to remind us that God answers prayer and responds to our worship. And we sing, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Doesn't that sound like a passage of Scripture? Something in the Ten Commandments? Repeated by Christ? Reminding us to keep our priorities straight and to obey the First Commandment. And we sing, holy is the Lord. Teaching us the character of a God. And we sing the Invitation Fountain. And if you saw that, you probably wondered, didn't somebody spell something wrong? Isn't it Invitation Fountain? And the answer is no. That's actually the title of the song. A song which calls us to come to Jesus, teaching us that He is the rock, the source of strength, the one who heals, and He encourages us to follow Christ and follow Him wholeheartedly. We teach and we admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I don't know about you, but I have fun doing it. I love singing the songs. I love singing Celebrate Jesus, where the kids from the youth group are doing the funky clap. You know, I used to be able to do that 20 years ago when they introduced that to us. You see those little kids... And they're, and they're celebrating Christ, something wonderful. Paul says, teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We do it with the Word, fully focused on the Word of God. Relying upon the wisdom which comes from knowing Jesus. And worshiping, knowing that out of our worship, 
we draw closer to Christ and we draw one another closer to Christ. Over the past three weeks, our text has taught us how to treat one another. It comes to a conclusion, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And that is why we bear with one another. And it's why we forgive one another. And it's why we teach and admonish. The thing is, the order is important. I do not believe it is a mistake that the Holy Spirit inspired these words to be written in this order. First bear with one another, then forgive one another, and only then teach and admonish one another. You know... Josh was up here and he said, you know, you have to forgive me because I'm, you know, I'm confessing this and I'm repenting. He actually didn't say he was repenting. I think he kind of implied he's going to do it again. <laughs> but he, we understood that. And, and I could have responded and said, I forgive you. Now unplug him. So I'm going to teach him a lesson. And there is one of the problems. Because if we believe that we are going to teach and admonish somebody before... We have been willing to forgive them. And before we have been willing to be compassionate and kind and merciful and tender and meek and humble, if we come and we put teaching and admonishing before those things, you can be certain our teaching and admonishing is going to fall flat on its face. Paul teaches us how to respond to one another, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. Teaching and admonishing one another. And there's a cool thing here, and this is where I, I was tempted to make another sermon out of this text, but three times in these verses, three times in these verses, Paul mentions thanksgiving. Verse 15, and be thankful. Verse 16, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And verse 17, give thanks to God the Father. Part of the blessing of our relationship with Christ, part of the blessing of our relationship with one another, is that we can bear with one another, forgive one another, teach and admonish one another, all the while being thankful to God that we have one another. Let's pray and transition to communion. Father, I thank you that you have chosen to place us in a family in this gathering of believers and that you've given us great instructions on how best to treat one another in a way which brings you honor and glory. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have given us not only the command to bear with one another, but the strength to do so. You have given us not only the command to forgive one another, but the example of how to do it. And you have given us not only the command to teach and admonish, but you've given us your word, you've given us your wisdom, and you've given us worship. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.